bring to the forefront of our audience this morning. And then I've got a couple of questions I'd like to answer first before we actually look into the body of the text. So the first thing I want to look at is the principles that we are learning from this passage. And the very first principle that we have come to learn from the life of Jacob is the principle of sowing and reaping. In other words, we reap what we sow. If we sow seeds that are going, well, if when we sow seeds, we're going to get a harvest. Is ultimately it's going to happen. You sow good seeds, you're going to get a good harvest. You sow bad seeds in your life, you're also going to get a harvest of bad things. It's going to happen to you. Now, when it comes to this principle of sowing and reaping, this is something that was found right in the very beginning of our Bibles. In fact, right in the beginning of, of Genesis chapter 1, when God created the, the, the plant life, he said this, And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So right from the very beginning of Genesis, we see that God has a principle that if you sow apple seeds, you're going to get apples. You're going to get an apple tree. And so if you, produce, if you sow certain seeds, you're going to get the fruit of that type of seed. But it also says in Galatians this about sowing and reaping, and this is something we should all take to heart. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith. So we see right from the very beginning that our thoughts and our actions are seeds that are, we are sowing into this life. And that seed will bring back a harvest. That will bring a harvest. So every thought and action that you and I uh, engage in in our life is going to produce a fruit. And if we spend our time sowing seeds to the flesh, we will reap the results of that, which we'll be very unhappy about. But if we take the opportunity and do good to all men, especially unto the household of faith, as we sow seeds of goodness and kindness to people around us, that will also reap the results for ourselves as well. Our thoughts and actions are all seeds. But I was thinking also about sowing and reaping. Jacob sowed seeds of deception. Remember that in chapter 27, I think it was, of Genesis, where he and his mother conspired to, to take the birthright from his brother and also to deceive the father. You remember in Genesis 24 that um, uh, um, Isaac asked Jacob, he said, then he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. He lied. He deceived his father. And eventually he reaped being himself deceived. Remember in Genesis 29, we just read it. What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? So here he is reaping the results of his own life. He deceived his father, and he was now deceived himself. This is the way, the principles that we see in God's word. It is manifest in our lives. Every time we plant a, a seed in our garden, we expect the fruit to be from that very same seed. But then we have a, a big question that I want to ask, and this is something I, I try and break, make it practical for all of us. If I sowed bad seeds, bad things before I got saved, does salvation wipe the slate clean? Now that's a good question, isn't it? Because we all have sowed rotten seeds, bad seeds before we were saved. But what happens after I get saved? What happens to those 
the results of those seeds? Well, um, salvation wipes clean the sin and the guilt of previous transgressions, but not necessarily the consequences. Let me give you an example. If in my former life, I made it a habit of defrauding the IRS and I was caught and fined. And um, I would find forgiveness after I got saved. And uh, God would, uh, you know, I would find forgiveness with God when I get saved. But my debt to the IRS is still valid in spite of how nice Chris and Mike are. Uh, <laughs> You see, God has forgiven me, but sometimes the results of a life that has uh, not lived according to his will has result, brought results in my life that I can't escape from. I am still responsible for those things. So if I'm speaking to someone here this morning and you have sowed lots of not good things in your former life and you got saved, the Lord is absolutely clear in forgiving you. It's done. It's settled. But you might still be left re with results that you need to deal with. Um, the other principle that I'm thinking about is the principle of divine guidance. And as we go through this passage, as we look through it, we can see that God very clearly guided Jacob to the right woman and to the right place. It was really a miracle. And in fact, when you think about it, it is a miracle that God, the God of uh, the omnipotent God who spoke the universe into existence is interested in your little life and my little life that he is prepared to guide me in the little details of my life. Now that's exciting to think about it. It's a miracle really to think that God would, as, as great and awesome as he is, that he would be think enough of me to be able to guide me and guide you in your life. God does guide. And I was thinking, when it comes to the guidance of God, there's four ways that God guides us. The first one is guidance through the Bible. As we read our Bibles, we see instruction there as to how we should live our lives. We see guidance through Christians. Oftentimes, when we need help, we can talk to our fellow believers, and they can guide us as well and give us some principles to live by. And then you have guidance from the Holy Spirit. But then there's also the fourth way that God guides us. And I was thinking of this, particularly in this passage this morning, is that God guides through circumstances. Um, God is sovereign. And he controls all the details that cross my path. And as a result of that, he can guide me by the circumstances that he allows myself to be in. Remember, so Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the East. Just imagine it for a minute. Here he is, he's been told, now you got to get out of here because your brother's going to kill you. So you got to go to your, my family's four uh, land. And uh, so he travels this 500 mile journey to this land of the East. And he has no GPS, he has no address, no coordinates. And he's just traveling in the middle of nowhere. And what does he do is he comes on this journey. He came to the land of the east. And he looks and there's a well in the field. And he stops there. And, uh, and then he said, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And, and they said, oh, yeah, we know him. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? When you think of the circumstances that brought him together. And just at that very time as well. So he said to them, is he well? And they said, yeah, he's well. And look, here's his daughter, Rachel, coming with his sheep. Tremendous circumstances that the Lord just brought together to, to bring Rachel and this guy together. Um, since God does guide, um, does that mean that my road will have complications? You know, oftentimes when God has guided us in this particular, a particular way, and we're absolutely clear he guided us, does that mean that that road is without difficulties or without problems? I was thinking of the Apostle Paul. He says this 
And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. He had a vision of this dream of the country of Macedonia. And there was a man saying, come on over and helping us. And, and now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. No question that Paul was supposed to go to Macedonia. Now, does that mean that everything was hunky-dory? He didn't have any problems. It says this later on in 2 Corinthians, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. So my dear fellow believer this morning, I want you to understand that when God guides, and he does, that doesn't mean that you won't have difficulties along the way. That is all part of the package. And so these things are things that we can learn from this. Now, I've got a couple of questions that I want to look at first before we get into the body of, of, of the message. How does one reconcile marriage between cousins and other close relatives in the Bible? That's a, a question that often comes up when you start to think of, of, of how these folks met and, 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 and lived with each other. Now, in the early days of humanity, there was a need for marriage between close relatives. You remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam's and Eve's children married their siblings by necessity. Uh, I don't know how all that worked, but it did. And uh, the introduction of the Law of Moses gave clear instructions that Intimate relations between close relatives was forbidden in Leviticus. But interestingly, marriage between cousins is nowhere forbidden in the Bible. And as you go through the scriptures, you see that that was never a difficulty. But I have another question. And um, just being a practical sort of dude, and I'm thinking, okay, how on earth did this guy... He worked seven years for this bride, okay? And, uh, you know, the wedding night. And uh, he, he, he hasn't a clue who he slept with, and he wakes up the next morning. That, who are you? You know, where did this all come from? How did, like, I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, how did this happen? Well, I've got some suggestions. It might have something to do with it. Uh, darkness could have had something to do with it. Um, it did say it was in the evening time, but didn't they have candles or something? I'm sure they did. Um, uh, a heavy veil on Leah and ornate bridal clothing would have also aided in the deception. I'm sure that came off eventually, but um, pardon me for just being um, blunt here. But it is also possible that Leah and Rachel look similar and were generally the same size. Um, but I think this probably had more to do with it. Jacob might have been drinking, and that impacted his perception. It was customary for feasts, uh, especially wedding feasts, to include alcohol. So it could have been that he was just really happy and not realizing what was going on. So that's how I answered this question. Uh, question number three, why did God allow polygamy? more than one wife at the same time in the Bible. Why was that? Uh, and, you know, it's quite common in our Old Testament. Old Testament records, um, polygamous uh, lives of many of the patriarchs, yet polygamy was never God's will for his people. Um, the first instance of polygamy in the Bible is that of Lamech in Genesis 4. Lamech married two women. Um, several prominent men in the Old Testament were polygamous. Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, and others all had multiple wives. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He must have broke the bank on Mother's Day. That was, uh, how would he manage that? Um, so why did God allow polygamy uh, in the Bible? The Bible does not specifically say why God allowed polygamy. And we must remember that allowance is not the same as approval. 
Um, as we speculate about God's permissive silence, there's at least one key factor to consider when it comes to the idea of polygamy. In patriarchal societies, it was nearly impossible for an unmarried woman to provide for herself. Um, you know, uh, women were often uneducated and untrained. Um, women relied on their fathers and brothers and husbands for provision and protection. Uh, unmarried women were often subjected to uh, prostitution and slavery. So God may have allowed polygamy to protect and provide for the women who otherwise uh, may have been left destitute. You know, I was um, at the gym I go to, my coach there, he's from Venezuela, and uh, he has 20 siblings um, from all over the place that his father sired with many different wives. And a lot of these young girls were desperate in the situation that, that where they were living and where they were raised, and and they were looking for protection. And um, well, this this guy, he's he's 83 right now, and he's he's been he's married to several women, and his most current wife is 22. Um, and yet, perhaps this is a way that some of these girls are protected and and provided for, I, I don't really know, but but it is a, a, a difficult question to know really what was going on. So, but anyways, how does God view polygamy today? Um, even while recording cases of polygamy, the Bible presents monogamy as God's ideal for marriage. That was his plan right from the beginning. For this reason, remember Genesis chapter 2, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, not wives, and they will become one flesh, not fleshes, according to Genesis chapter 2. And in the New Testament, you remember that, that the, there are qualifications for church leaders, those who are elders and deacons in the assembly, that they must be the husband of one wife uh, as a qualification for a spiritual leadership in the church. So what happens when a polygamist gets saved? If a man has multiple wives and becomes a Christian, what is he supposed to do? Now, that's not something you would normally have to answer here in the, in the United States. But in Botswana... It was something that we had to answer. Uh, oftentimes, men had more than one wife in Botswana. And then they, they get saved. Now what happens? What do you do? Now, when we arrived in Botswana, our missionary colleagues had already established the routine, what they would do. And culturally in Botswana, it was anathema for somebody who was a real Christian to have more than one wife. So that was already established. But there were so many people in Botswana, so many men that had more than one wife. And uh, so this was how they, they handled it and the way I was taught to handle it as well. And I think it was the best way. He was to choose one wife to be faithful to. And the other wives were divorced and free to remarry. But he remained responsible to care for the other wives and the children. He was still responsible financially to keep them and up, um, take care of them. But he just had one wife and was responsible for the others until they were remarried. And, and that often took the place. So, so anyways, that's our my preamble here. And um, now let's get into the body of our, of our message. So the passage breakdown is, is this way. I've looked at it this way. Departure to Heron, uh, divine arrangement, and deception and delay. So there's my three Ds. I actually got four there. Um, before we do that, I just want us to look here just very briefly at, at Jacob's four wives. And just so you can see the picture here, I'm a visual learner. I like to see what's going on. So you have here Leah, 
she gave birth to one, two, three, four, five, six sons and one daughter. And then Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to two boys. And then Bilhah, Rachel's servant, gave birth to two. And then finally, Rachel herself, she gave birth to, to two boys. So that's the little picture here of Jacob's family. Now, I want to talk about the departure to Haran. Jacob must have been exceptionally uh, discouraged as he fled his home. Remember, he had just deceived his father and his brother, and his mother and him, they conspired to put this whole thing together. And, uh, and you, know, you know, what did she say? Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, and flee to my brother Laban and Haran. Uh, I mean... She got him all into this trouble in the first place. And then she says, and stay with him a few days until your brother turns away, turns fury, uh, uh, his brother's fury turns away. You see, Esau was going to kill him. Esau was going to take Jacob out for what he had done. And when the mother heard about it, she said, listen, Esau, you got to go cool off. Let, let, let uh, your brother cool off. Why don't you take off to my family for a few days and then when he's, he's cooled down, he can come on back. Well, you know, he never came back. Well, he did come back 20 years later. 20 years later, and his mother had passed away. So already there was a, a terrible seeds and fruit from the, the way they had sown their, their life. All he had to think about was his sin and failure of deceiving his father. You can imagine him, a young man, he's heading out, and now he's left his home behind and he's plagued by the sin of, uh, or the guilt of his sin of, be of betraying his father and his brother. And he's running for his life. And he was in a new challenging environment. And uh, then the Lord affirmed his relationship with Jacob. And this is really important. In Genesis 28, remember that, behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Remember, this was in Bethel, and he had that tremendous dream of the angels going up and down the ladder. And, um, and it was like God reconfirming his love to Jacob. That even though he had sinned, I haven't given up on you. I still have a plan. And when the Lord meets us in our need, even after failure, it lifts our heart, doesn't it? Jacob was affirmed that God hadn't given up on him. Now, what about you and I? Sometimes we need that affirmation. As the enemy can make us feel our failures define us, and that our future is spoiled. You know, I was thinking of this in Revelation. Uh, now is come uh, salvation. Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You know, um, I'm a sinning saint. And I'm speaking to a lot of sinning saints here. I, understand, I know this. And, you know, when we do something wrong as a Christian, uh, we may have sensed, you know, I know the Lord saved me. I know he forgave me when I got saved. But, but when I do something wrong after I got saved, how do I handle that? I might... Confess it to the Lord, but, but, but then there's that devil who's there always to accuse me and always reminds me of my failure as a Christian. Do you ever feel that way, like a failure as a Christian? Uh, you, you know the Lord, you know you've been saved, and yet there are times we fail him, and as a result of that, we, we are often uh, bombarded by guilt and we can't seem to get loose of that. And I want to just remind you today of that wonderful verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I don't know how many times I've come back to the Lord and, and treasured this wonderful verse 
that we as the people of God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that great news for us who are believers and we fail the Lord? And just to know the fact that his work isn't just enough to save me. It's there to keep me. And not only is my salvation secure because of what he has done on the cross, but my life is maintained and my relationship and fellowship with him is continually maintained because of the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. He has forgiven our sins. So God is not finished with you. Let that affect your walk and attitude. So divine arrangement. Jacob's meeting with his future bride was not an accident. God's purposes will be accomplished in us if we are open to him. I was thinking of this wonderful verse in Philippians chapter 1. In fact, this verse, just to go back, remember I, I was in Botswana in the first Seven months, I came down with TB meningitis, and I was um, paralyzed, and we came back to, to Ontario at the time, and I was in a special rehab hospital for spinal cord patients, and I remember the first thing my physiotherapist was trying to get me to do was to learn how to crawl again. So we were in the gymnasium, and I'm on my hands and knees, and I'm trying to crawl like a baby, and I just was so troubled by that, and I... I asked if she would just leave me for a few moments and I just crumbled before God and I said, God, why have you allowed this thing to happen to me? Was I not doing your work? I went to Botswana to preach the gospel and within seven months I'm, I'm back here and I'm, I'm trying to learn how to walk again. I've already learned how to walk once. Do I need to do this again? And, and as I'm just praying, the Lord brought this verse to me. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the preposition, God was going to work in me, that just drove home to me. And then here again, this other verse, same thing came into my mind, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I began to understand that God was far more interested in the work that he was going to do in me than the work that he was ever going to do through me. And that was the most important lesson that I ever learned as a result of going through those difficult times. So here's this divine arrangement. After a 500-mile dangerous journey, he came to the right place at the right time to meet the right person. That's how God works. It's amazing, isn't it, how... God brought all the circumstances together for um, this guy to, to meet his future wife. It was love at first sight. Now, I was thinking about this as well. Again, I like to try and bring this, to make it as practical as possible. But what is proper love built on? You know, we've got some tremendously strong marriages here and they've been on the road for well, I've been married to my dear wife for 41 years, and others have been married to their wives longer. And the, I can just thank the Lord that he has made a, a, the right relationship. But, you know, I know that there's some young people here today, and you might be wondering, how will God bring my partner into my life? And what am I to look for? And I was thinking of external attraction is important. I mean, you've got to find your future partner attractive. That's important. But it's the inner character, isn't it, that is really, really important. That's the critical thing. So what was she really like? And I'm thinking of, of, of Rachel. Scripture is not entirely positive of Rachel because just look at what I've discovered here. She was given to envy in, in chapter 30, verse 1. She sought human help, not divine help, when she, was discovered, when she discovered she was barren. Um, although blessed with beauty and loved best by Jacob, she still strove with Leah and was competitive with her. That's not an attractive trait. Um, she was an opportunistic thief in in 31 verse 19 she kept these things from her husband she hid things from her husband which was wrong 
She was a deceiver in verse 35 of chapter 31. It appears she was an idolater as well. So things are not real good about the character of this lady. She was a beautiful girl, but there was a lot of things that should have sent flags up. Now, we live in an age that we, today that we live in, the heavy emphasis on the exterior, what a person looks like, their shape, and, you know, you just, all you have to do is turn the TV on and you get bombarded by this idea that our world is, is attracted to beauty, and that's the most important feature. Well, that is really not the right thing to look at. Now, I want to talk about deception and delay. Remember this, you reap what you sow. So very much of the same has uh, he had done to Isaac. The seed he sowed. He deceived his father about his being the firstborn. He reaped a firstborn daughter as an unwanted wife. So you can see that you sow, you're going to reap. He got a taste of his own medicine and it can be very educational for us. I was thinking when he woke up and, 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 and he says, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I have served you? Why then have you deceived me? You see, Jacob was outraged. And it was a, a, a bit of a, his own medicine. Now he knew how Isaac and Esau must have felt when they discovered that they had been cheated and deceived. So... In summary, I want to look at it this way. Um, Genesis 29 depicts Jacob's journey to his mother's homeland, his love for Rachel, his decept the deception of Laban, and the complex relationships between Jacob and his wives, Leah and Rachel. The birth of the children through multiple wives and servants Jacob's eventually prosper, eventual prosperity through divine intervention. Now that's our chapter today. We trust that God would bless his word to us and that we've all maybe gleaned something practical as well. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we uh, come into your presence uh, at the close of this meeting this morning. We thank you for uh, the promise that you will uh, always accompany your word with power that will affect change in people's lives. And Lord, we confess to you, we feel very weak. And uh, we ask that, Lord, as your word goes forth today, that it will fall on good ground and that this seed will produce fruit to a harvest. We ask, Lord, that all of us here in our lives, that we might know what it is to keep a close account with you to serve you, and to live our lives for you. We think of maybe someone here today, and perhaps this whole message is a bit strange about knowing the Lord, and we just pray, Father, for them, that you would uh, use what has been said and what they've witnessed, Lord, to bring conviction of sin and salvation through the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all the good things we enjoy today, and ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.